let's go and continue with our discussion of the IPO. You've got the issuance. This is once the SEC sees the prospectus and sees your plan for an issuance and it gives the approval. The corporation or its investment bank, that's what investment bank is very often, that's the service they provide. If, if you're a, a company, you probably don't have the ability to market things to the public because you just don't have the mechanism by which you're going to be able to sell things to the public. So you go to an investment bank, it might be Solomon Brothers or you know, Merrill Lynch or something like you know, Goldman Sachs, something to that effect, and they take care of it for you. They will, uh, I don't know if they'll help you write the prospectus, I think that's really the job of the law firm that you hire to comply with the SEC rules, but once the prospectus is written and everything is ready to go, the investment bank will then set the initial price and start selling things to the public. And then we've got the next stage. The next stage, you start with the pre-filing period. Then you have to wait for, every, for the approvals and then the post-effective period. Let's look at these one at a time. You've got the pre-filing period. This is when the issuer contemplates securities, offering securities, uh, and ends when the registration statement is filed with the SEC. Now, this is really the initial stage. You're still kind of looking into it. You're talking to the lawyers. You might not even be dealing with the investment banks yet. You know, you might be considering hiring them, but yet the lawyers are probably drafting up the prospectus and making a determination of whether it's worth it to sell these things on the open market. During this period, you can't sell because you haven't gotten approval from the SEC yet. You cannot condition the market. You can't, in other words, tell everybody in the market that this great new stock is coming because the SEC hasn't given you permission to sell this thing or to advertise this thing. And so to start advertising it would be jumping the gun and would be premature and would be the sort of thing the SEC would frown upon because it's against the law. And you can't even engage in a public relations campaign to pump the value of the stock. Then you've got the waiting period. This is when the registration papers have actually been filed with the SEC, and now it's kind of a matter of time before everything is it gets final approval to actually issue these things in the open market. At this time, you can start advertising. You can condition the market, you can distribute the prospectus, and then finally, when you're ready to go, this is when the, the post-effective period, this is when the registration actually becomes effective and the securities can now be traded on the open market. During this time, of course, and you can run ads, you can see this term over here, tombstone ad, that just you know generally means a relatively simple newspaper or magazine ad. You can run other types of ads too. You can ad write, pretty much you can write and you can advertise however you like as long as you don't say false things and as long as the prospectus itself doesn't condition the market. Your other advertising can, of course. I mean, whenever you're trying to sell something, whenever you're trying to say this security is a great security, well, you can advertise and you can build up and you can try to condition the market all you, all you like uh, because now you're actually selling the stock. And selling stock that should have been registered with the SEC and was not was a, is actually a crime. There's criminal penalties and any investors, in other words, if you float this stock to the to the public without getting security, without getting permission of the SEC, without filing the appropriate documents, then not only can the investors sue for their money back, the person who did it can be subjected to criminal penalties. Somebody who does, and this, this applies pretty much for other securities regulations ex as well. If there is a violation of the SEC Act of 1933, that imposes civil liability, which means somebody that was victimized by this failure, who purchased the stock, or who lost the money in a transaction, they can file lawsuits. And this applies whether they actually bought stock that shouldn't have been issued, or whether the stock should have been issued and was issued properly, but there was material information that was missing from the prospectus. Any of these circumstances allows a lawsuit, allows a cause, a cause of action. The SEC itself can also enforce securities rules, as we discussed before. It can issue a consent order, in other words, it can order a company to rectify certain behavior adding things to, per, to the prospectus, stopping to sell certain securities, whatever remedy they want. Now, the SEC in and of itself cannot actually force a company to do something because the SEC is not a court, it's an administrative agency. But what it can do, it can order somebody to stop and then if they don't, they can bring an action for an injunction or they can ask for other relief. And like I said before, the 
Department of Justice, which is also a federal federal uh, agency, can bring criminal prosecution against people who violate securities rules. And now I want to focus a little bit more on some of the minutia of the securities rules. That was kind of an overview. And let's take a look at some of the most important and some of the most commonly discussed types of securities rules. First of all, over here, we've got Rule 144A, which is trying to increase the liquidity, which means the ability to buy and sell easily, of registered securities. And this permits qualified institutional investors to buy even unregistered securities without the holding period necessary, based on the idea, assuming these securities will eventually be allowed to, sell, to be sold to the public, some institutional investors don't necessarily need the same kinds of protections as ordinary investors would. They go in there with their eyes open much more, and so therefore the rules are a little bit more relaxed regarding some of them. Some securities are exempt from registration and don't have to go through this long, onerous, and expensive process. This includes securities issued by any government in the United States, such as state bonds, federal bonds, uh, things like that. Short-term notes that have a maturity, a maturity that doesn't exceed nine months. In other words, if I want to sell short-term debentures or short-term bonds that are only three months long, I don't have to go through the whole process. Securities issued by nonprofit issuers, like charities, organizations, they, if they want to sell a, uh, a certain security, or like usually bonds, or securities of financial institutions that are regulated by the appropriate banking authorities on the idea that, you know, let's say a bank's stock, they are regulated anyway, so there's no need to increase the second level of regulation regarding the securities. Other examples include securities issued by common carriers. These include certain things like railroads and utilities, and the reason for this is that they are, in any case, regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission. So again, for the same reason regarding issues of the bank securities, the, uh, we don't want the SEC to overly burden a particular industry. So if they're already being regulated by another industry, by another watchdog group anyway, there's no point in doubling the regulation. Insurance and annuity contracts by insurance companies, again, they're also very heavily regulated by insurance laws. Stock dividends and stock splits and securities issued where one security is exchanged for another security. These things were already, 7 and 8 were already covered by the SEC. Uh, they were When they were originally sold to the open market, they had to go through the entire IPO process. So again, just because they split their stock, and split stock usually means they, they divide off one stock into two stocks and they're worth less, or they do a reverse split where two stocks are, are combined into one stock, and there are various price reasons why they do that that we don't really need to get into right now. Uh, basically, if they get too expensive, the stock goes too high, very often they'll split. If it gets too low, very often they'll do a reverse split. But either way, uh, you don't have to go through the whole process again.